uh, to our virtual summer teacher sessions. Um, we are in week, uh, I'm sorry, block three, week one. Um, we're just getting right through. The summer seems like it's going by pretty quick. So welcome. We are looking at row crops today. And we actually have a special guest with us, um, Charlie Rogie, who we will be talking to in just a minute. Um, so go ahead, sit back, relax. We've got a lot in here for you with our Roblox. Um, and we are going to go ahead and move on to Charlie Rogie's video. So we're going to watch a video from him and then we're going to speak with him right after his video. Hey, Stephanie, before we show the video, um, yep. sorry, um, why don't we give Charlie a chance to just introduce himself and Charlie, why don't you say sure. how old you are, where you're from and kind of give us just uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, <clears throat> I'm Charles Rogie. I'm from Arnsville, Illinois in Cass County. I'm 11 and I'm going to be in sixth grade this year. Awesome. Yeah, sixth grade is such an exciting year. And Charlie has worked with us last year. Um, and he just has a lot of uh, knowledge about agriculture and farming and tractors. So we're going to learn about different uh, machinery that's used um, on the field. So here we go. Hi, this is Charles Rogie with another farm video. Today, I'm at my farm in Orangeville, Illinois. Orangeville is a small town with about 450 people. And we're located in Cass County in West Central Illinois. On my farm, we have about 100 head of cattle. We grow corn, soybeans, and a little bit of wheat. And we grow a few acres of sweet corn that we sell at a roadside stand. We have several big tractors that we use for planting and harvesting and other things around the farm. We use them at certain times of the year. But some things Sometimes we have to use a small utility tractor, and a small utility tractor makes a day-to-day -day job easier. A tractor is just a tractor until you hook an implement up to it. It, it is really the implement that will be doing the work. The tractor provides the power for the implement. What are implements? Well, they are the detachments that we hook up to the tractor. Sometimes an implement will go in the front of the tractor and sometimes behind the tractor. It depends on the implement. Some examples of implements that we use are, that include our mowers, grain augers, hay rakes, and tethers. So before you can use mowers, rakes, tethers, and brain augers and other implements, we have to have the power. And that's where the tractor comes in. There has to be a way to transfer the power from the tractor to the implement. And that mechanism is called power takeoff shaft or just PTO. The PTO transfers the power of the tractor to the implement. A mower can't run without a motor, so the PTO connects the motor from the tractor to the mower so that it can run. It's kind of like plugging in to an outlet at your house. Like a lamp or a TV won't work unless you have power to plug it in. And now I'm going to show you how to get a power from the tractor to the implement. We're here and this is a tether and it takes the PTO to power it and the tether flings out the hay like this so that it can dry after we mow it. And then we have the rake which rolls up the hay so we can bale it and it takes hydraulics. Now we're going to do the tether and since I can't do that on my own my dad's going to help me hook it up and run it.
And now we're gonna do it. This is the PTO shaft here. And then this is the PTO for the tractor that makes this spin, which will make these spin. So it'll fling everything out. Now we're gonna start the tractor and engage the PTO. implement started working so now that's how you put power to your implement this is the hay rake and this uses a different type of power which is a hydraulics these are the hydraulic hoses and then we plug the hoses into the hydraulic outlets so now I'm going to connect it with the pin And now we're going to plug in the outlet and start going after we raise the jack. We found on our farm that labeling where they go is a really good solution. So we have number one left goes in here and number one right goes in here. So now we're going to pull up and start the tractor and run the machine. By using this lever, I'm going to unfold it. And those are just a couple ways of, to get power to a couple other implements. When we're using a PTO, we have to be very careful and pay close attention. Many farm accidents happen around PTOs because you could get too close to the rotation and, sh and a shirt sleeve could get caught in it and pull the person too close and cause serious injuries. Some PTOs have safety shields on them, but you still have to be aware of your location in case you don't get so close. There are many ways implements, there are many, so many implements that a farmer could hook up to his tractor and his tractor supplies the power. This is just a small example of what, how the process is done. Farmers use implements every day on their farm and we have to switch implements several times a day depending on what job we're doing. But as you can see, it's fairly easy. It's a fairly easy task to unhook and hook up um, machines to the tractors. And that makes our job easier. This has been Charles Rogie. And until next time, stay safe. I love it. Thank you so much, Charles. That was great. You did an excellent job of explaining uh, both hydraulics and especially the PTO. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the safety aspect. I was going to ask you about that. So clearly you've... Uh, You've been uh, well-trained to make sure you're being safe around those for sure, yeah. My favorite quote is, uh, you said at the beginning, a tractor is just a tractor until you hook an implement up to it. I think we need to get t-shirts made with that. That's that's great, I, I love that line, yeah. Uh, what's what's your favorite piece of machinery to use on the farm? Uh, probably the cultivator. Okay, and why so? Why is that your favorite? I like, because I can run it more than the other ones and I've always ran it with my dad. So I know how to run it more than the other ones. And it's, I just like it more. Excellent. And Charlie, will you explain what a cultivator does? Oh, uh, so a cultivator turns the ground. So they have prongs and you unfold it with the hydraulics and you hook it up to the tractor. And the prongs go in the ground and turn the dirt. So it plows it, which means it turns the dirt and makes sure 
it's good enough to plant in and level. So in a uh, in a garden situation, a cultivator would be kind of like using a hoe by hand, but yeah. you can't do that. You can't do that on uh, six, seven hundred acres at a time. Got a comment that somebody's uncle was almost killed in a PTO accident. So I'm glad that your dad's there to help you all along uh, doing those things. So, uh, Charlie, you like you like those uh, you like the implement, but um, I want you to step back in time. Now, I know sometimes you get to go to the restaurant and the coffee shop with your dad and that kind of stuff and hear some of the old timers. What do you think of the progress that's been made and how far farm machinery's come in, in the last couple of years? What, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, extra time do you think that gives farmers by having all this new technological equipment? It really helps them out because now it gets the job done quicker and makes sure it's done more better you could say and it's much easier to do and it's just good to have all that technology and it's less man work and people work so it saves their energy more. Now, do uh, you ever have a situation though where you you need that you need a different implement? Uh, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and uh, your your farm is spread out. It's all not right just at your house, right? So, yeah. uh, explain explain some of the planning that goes into that. Um. Well, we have to make sure what we're going to be doing that day. Like when we arrive to the farm, we know what we're going to do, and we discuss it in our office. And then we go out and do the different jobs. First, somebody feeds the cows, and then we have to take um, our trucks to go to the different places to um, use the machines. Like sometimes somebody's going to be plowing, somebody's going to be cult or um, planting or spraying and combining, and who's hauling it that day, and who's going where to get parts. And uh, it's it's kind of funny, uh, Charlie. I had to giggle because you're talking about going to the office, and you know you are just 11. But something tells me that uh, as much as you'd like to, you don't get to make all the decisions though about who does what, right? So who who actually is the boss? I know you like to think you are, and sometimes well, you come across that way. But who's the boss on the farm? Well, it was my grandpa, and then the boys, my uncles and dad, just. Like, they're all three the bosses. They, like, discuss it before anybody does anything. But they still let you in the office. That's good to know. That's good to know. Chris, look like you had a question. So uh, you talked about the, uh, the tether and the, and the rake. So can you talk a little bit about why we need those implements? Why can't we just cut the, cut the hay and then and bale it up? Why, why does the farmer need to use those implements before they bale it? Because you want the hay to dry so it's not wet and bunched up. And the baler can't get it all that much. When you mow it, right after you mow it, the baler sometimes isn't wide enough to get all the hay and you don't want to waste any. So you take the tether after you mow it so you can let it dry so it's not wet hay because that's not really what you want. But then um, you take the rake after and make it into a windrow like a row and so the baler can fit under it and get all the hay so you're uh, you're very much in a race with the weather right once you get that cut you want to make sure that uh, it's going to have a couple days to dry and you can get it bailed and out of there before it gets rained on so who needs a casino right you're, you're gambling with the weather all the time right yeah we have uh every time we mow hay it usually rains sure uh, yeah absolutely first. yeah All right. Well, very good. Uh, Kevin, you have any more questions for Charlie? Well, let's let's have Charlie put a plug in. Charlie, this isn't your only uh, this isn't your only video activity that you do. You want to tell the folks what you do on a weekly basis and, and uh, what what you do for uh, our Illinois Farm Bureau newspaper? Um, well, I do the crop washers for you guys. Um, crop washer 2.0. Uh, I work on some things on the farm and not much else. It's mainly just working on the farm. 
And Crop Watchers 2.0, uh, so folks that aren't familiar with that, uh, weekly farmers from across the state report on the weather conditions and what happened. So every week, uh, Charlie submits a video and he talks about what's been going on in West Central Illinois. So I think you probably have to turn those in on Thursday or Friday, right, Charlie? Is that when your, your deadline is? So uh, he turns those in on Thursday or Friday, and then they automatically go to the uh, Farm Week Now Facebook page and those posts. So i got a couple questions here. How often do you bale hay and at what time of the year, Charlie? And what um, are you bale baling? What kind of hay are you baling? Uh, we bale alfalfa, clover, and some grass. And we bail, we usually try to start in May or early June, and we bail till August, even sometimes September, because we want to get as much hay as we can for the winter. Um, but we bail each field, if it grows back enough, we bail it three to four times, maybe two, so it, we get as much hay as we can. We got another question here about how are the crops doing and we totally forgot one of your side gigs charlie works other gigs too you told us a little bit about what's going to be happening this weekend on your farm but tell us how the crops are doing and a little bit about your side venture that you'll start up this weekend um well the crops are doing good besides some farmers during the big rain lost a whole field of crops whole field of corn and that's not too good but um, our crops are doing fine. Our beans are doing good. Our corn's looking good. And this weekend, we're hopefully going to start sweet corn and selling it and picking it. So Charlie and his family, they have a sweet corn business. So if you're in the greater Orangeville area, and uh, folks, if you aren't familiar where that is, uh, head to Jacksonville and you're, you're about, you're close. It's in the Jacksonville area. So west of Jacksonville, close to the Illinois River. Uh, but uh, that's where Charlie will be uh, selling sweet corn. And uh, tell us about the prices. What's, what's the deal for a bag of sweet corn? How many do you get for a dozen? $4 a dozen. $4 a dozen for some of the best sweet corn you'll find. So, and usually uh, we put a couple extra in. <laughs> You're gonna lose money that way, Charlie. You gotta, you gotta stick to the, <laughs> stick to the schedule. Stick to well, the schedule. Well, it's not good. You gotta put extra in. Yeah, but his sweet corn's always good. So, folks, we always enjoy when Charlie comes and visits. Uh, watch for his uh, Farm Watchers, uh, Crop Watchers 2.0. Uh, we'll make sure that we share the link uh, later this week on Facebook as well. So, Chris, I'll let you take it back there. All right, well, very good. Thank you, Charlie. We appreciate you joining us this morning. And uh, yeah, go enjoy the rest of your day. Happy farming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. All, All right. right. Very good. Yeah, go, take it away, Stephanie. Okay, let me share my screen again. So uh, we are talking all about row crops today um, and everything in between those is a lot of information. So part of row crops has to do with the machinery and the equipment that's used. And um, so Charlie highlighted all that. Um, and so before we actually get into actual row crops, we wanna talk to you about how you can use maps in your classroom um, and especially when teaching about row crops. So I have a Kahoot for us to start out with. Um, so if you would either open a new window or another tab and go to www.kahoot.it and then that'll bring up a purple screen and there should be a little place to add your game pin and our game pin is right here on the screen. It is 7108235. So I'm going to leave this up. Um, I'm gonna leave this up for just a minute, let you guys get situated. So 7108235 um, and our, the website is www.kahoot.it. Um, and so this is a fun activity that you can do with your students as a way to introduce um, map um, skills when you're looking at geography, when you're looking at um, spatial, um, with, with the dots and looking at, you know, all of the, the different acres and the numbers and, and when we're looking at um, quantitative data. Um, so this is a fun way that you can do this. And it's just kind of a, a fun game in general. And this is from the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, we will add the link to this website where you can get the maps um, 
It's going to be on the blog um, after this, so you guys will have access to this. Um, it's free for anybody to use, and if you want to make it a Kahoot, you can either make your own Kahoot or find us, um, Ag in the Classroom, on Kahoot, and then just copy it. Um, and ours is specifically looking at different types of crop, um, but there are different maps where it looks at uh, livestock as well. So let me stop sharing this screen, and let's go to our Kahoot. All right. So Stephanie you, didn't mention we yes. do have prizes for the what the top three, right? Yes, the top three. Thanks for reminding me. So if you win place uh, first, second, or third, we will send you um, a pack of ag mags based on one of our row crops, either corn, wheat, or soybeans, and then um, a nice uh, book that goes right along with that. So we are super excited. We love giving out prizes. So if you're in the top three, you will be getting a prize. And we may give about 15 more seconds to see um, if anybody else wants to join. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. So our agricultural geography. All right, one dot equals 10,000 acres. Which uh, type of crop would be where all the blue dots are? What do you think we're looking at? All right, so it is corn. That was our corn map. Where's my thing? Okay. All right, so we've got our some people placed on the board. Good job. All right, now this is one dot equals 5,000 acres. Got a little bit less. Looking at oranges, wheat, cotton, or soybeans, which would be where those dots are. So we are looking at cotton. So not one of our uh, more common um, row crops that we're looking at here, but we wanted to include some different types of crops that are being grown as well. So cotton was that one. All right. Number three, we're back to one dot equals 10,000 acres. We've got a lot in the, the Midwestern states. Okay, that one was soybeans. Awesome job. All right, and of course, for all of our teachers out there, if you use Kahoot, you can obviously change the time. We did it um, pretty quick, so. Um, this is one dot equals 1,000 acres, 1,000 acres, a lot smaller. And that one is our potatoes. A lot of that was um, in the state Idaho. All right. All right, we've got two more. Going back up to one dot equals 10,000 acres. So this is a little bit spread out. Okay, and that one was wheat. Awesome, and very last one. All right, now we're looking at one dot equals 3,000 acres. All right, and that one was rice, so awesome, awesome. All right, me, me got third place, Suzanne, we got second, and our first place winner is Ash. So congratulations, you three, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, Chris, can you write down these winners? And then for our first, second, and third place winner, if you in the Q&A could just write out um, your first full and last name. Um, and we already have your address information for signing up. So as long as we have your first full and last name, we'll be able to get all of your other information from your sign up for our virtual um, stuff. So that's just a fun, um, that's just a fun uh, a map activity with Kahoot. Um, now, a lot of the maps, um, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at uh, the inventory and the harvesting and all of the data from 2017. Um, so that's another thing that maybe uh, for your junior high, high school uh, 
uh, students, you can look into researching, you know, what are the most current updated numbers um, and all of that kind of stuff. So this is a really fun map, map activity. And like I said, like this picture right here um, looks at milk cows. So there are um, various options when you're looking at livestock and um, and uh, row crops. So we just wanted to play that fun game to kick us off. So getting into row crops, um, corn, um, obviously a very popular row crop. Um, this is a little snip from our corn ag mag, um, but corn, we grow 12 million acres um, each year in Illinois alone. So that is a ton. Um, and that is gonna be about 2 billion bushels harvested every single year. Um, and the cool thing about corn is that, I mean, there are so many byproducts. And so you're looking at the amount of products that you can use just by one crop. Um, and our new corn ag mag um, it goes a little bit more into deal with that and so it's talking about you know what are some challenges that we are seeing you know in terms of maybe um, air quality or soil health or the use of ethanol or um, corn-based plastics um, or the amount of plastic being used and what are some of the solutions that we could use a, a crop like corn to help um, reduce you know some of this plastic waste or make it more eco-friendly um, so check out our corn ag mag um, for more of that. And you can see on this little pie chart, it's talking about out of all of this corn, you know, how much do we use um, in these different categories? Our soybeans, we are growing 10.7 million acres in Illinois. Um, and that's looking at in the entire US, uh, 698 million bushels um, each year. And Illinois is the number one in the United States for um, growing and harvesting soybeans. Um, and so we also added uh, this SNP. This is also from our soybean ag mag and it's looking at, well, what are the other uses of soybeans? So we, you know, especially here in Illinois and in the Midwest, you drive through all of these fields of soybeans and corn and, you know, and we in some different states and, and we think of the most basic things that we use it for, but there are so many other things that we use them for, um, you know, in different types of uh, the carpet backing, for example, and crayons and soaps. Um, and we had highlighted um, the idea of, of other uses last week when Chris talked about um, pigs and pork byproducts. So, you know, we also have, um, which we're gonna highlight next week, but we do have an indoor Beagle where it kind of talks about this and having students go through the stuff that they own at home to see you know, what, what's actually in there, in those um, products, ingredients in there. And then we have wheat. So um, wheat is a very good cover crop, um, but just to give you some background information, there are five different classes of wheat. We have the hard red winter, the hard red spring, the soft red winter, white wheat, and Durham wheat. And here in Illinois, um, we grow uh, the soft red winter. Um, it, it grows nicely in, under these conditions and the soil that we have here. And so that's the best for this type of um, geography and landscape and climate. Um, in Illinois, there are 540,000 acres planted each year. And the cool thing about wheat is that it is so widely grown um, that it is being harvested every single month of the year somewhere in the world, um, whether that is in the United States or in Asia, um, anywhere in the world, it's gonna be harvested every single year. There's just so many uses for it. It grows really well in a lot of different types of climate. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can use it, whether it's for cover crop or for um, our, our main products. Um, and later we are going to go into more of cover crops and talk about, you know, uh, its benefits with erosion and soil health and all of that. So those are our three, our three main um, row crops that we are focused on here in Illinois. So I'm going to give it over to Chris and he is going to um, talk to you guys about tillage. All right, I'm going to focus on a few different things, mostly related to the soil as they pertain to row crops. I think, you know, a lot of us can recognize a, a cornfield or a soybean field, but we maybe aren't as, as keyed into exactly what's happening at any given time in those fields. And so we wanted to highlight a few of those things with you this morning. And so tillage is one of those that you see a lot of variation um, on all these slides here. All these pictures are from Illinois. So we wanted to make sure we were showing you actual things that are happening in our state. And, you know, even though our state is, uh, you know, relatively flat, you know, there's still lots of different geography, geographies throughout the state. There's a number of different soil types throughout the state. And so, as we've said before, and what we'll continue to say, context is really important. Um, we can't assume that all farmers are able to do everything exactly the same because their context really does matter. And uh, Charlie talked about uh, 
how a technology is improved and how it makes things more efficient for the farmer. And we hear a lot about sustainability these days. And um, there's, there's different ways to think about sustainability. Oftentimes we think about environmental sustainability, but also you think about the sustainability of those farmers as well. If they don't have the, the time or the energy to do what they need to do, uh, it doesn't matter how environmentally sustainable they are. If they can't get the work done, then, then they're still not sustainable. And so um, we'll kind of highlight some different ways to think about that today and some uh, and kind of maybe better understand why farmers do things differently. So there's a number of different ways that we can approach tillage. Um, we see more and more these days that a lot of farmers are, are transitioning to no-till where they harvest a crop in the fall and they don't till that ground at all. And the following year, they will drill the seed into that untilled ground and it will grow up through that residue. The residue is the leftover crop from the, the previous year. Um, there's conventional tilling, um, which is they're cultivating, trying to get a, a good level seed bed, um, open up that soil so they can easily plant those seeds. Again, in some soils that is necessary, in other soils it's not necessary, and they're able to do no-till. Um, there's a thing called strip tilling. You can see in the bottom right where um, farmers are only tilling the section of the ground that they need to to be able to plant into that ground. So they're, they're, they're tilling less, opening up that soil less. And then this fourth one, contour strips, isn't necessarily a, a tillage, but it's it's same idea. The idea with contour strips is to, to limit erosion. This is one of the most important things that farmers can do is to limit erosion because obviously if, if their soil's gone, they have nothing else to grow in, right? And so you can see these contour strips here. Um, and so sometimes you'll see them, they follow the, the lay of the land. And so they're like a waterway where they would have grass growing in them. And when the water um, flows into that area, the grass slows it down and seeps into the ground and doesn't wash out any crops. The other way farmers can do contour strips is they can do it parallel to a hill. And so again, as water comes down that hill, it would stop when it hits that grassy patch, it would soak in, and then again, it's not moving soil down the hill. So a lot of different ways, a lot of approaches to tillage, again, depending on your soil type, depending on the temperature that year, depending on moisture levels, there's lots of different things that go into decisions that farmers make. And it's possible that year to year, they make different choices based on the, the soil or the weather conditions of that year. So lots of different ways to do that, lots of different implements farmers can use uh, in order to accomplish that tillage. Mm -hmm. And right, I do we'll want to add, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add, um, I, I really want to highlight what Chris said is that every farm is going to be different. And that that isn't necessarily based on the farmer themselves, but the decisions they're making based on like the geography of the land, the climate, and what is actually going to work there. And recently I've read a few articles, you know, about different, you know, farmers, even in different states and what is right and wrong for their, um, for their farm fields. And so I just want you guys to just be aware that if you're reading anything, um, you know, in the news or anything that it's, it's not one farm you know, one, one practice fits all. And so farmers who are choosing to continue conventional tilling, it's not because they don't care about the environment and they don't, you know, they're stuck in their old ways or anything. It's that, you know, they're, the geography of their land and the wind patterns and the climate in general, it may not be appropriate um, for that area and that farmland. So I just want to point that out, that farmers are making the decisions, um, what's best for their farming, their field, the crop and and for the environment and if a, a farmer is continuing to pr uh, practice conventional tilling they are doing other things as well that are, are you know becoming more sustainable and more um, environmentally friendly so there's a lot to it um, and I know even just from being in the Farm Bureau for a year and I'm hoping that you guys the last you know several weeks of, of joining us here is that you're learning more and more about agriculture and things that you know you, you don't actually think of until you're sitting down and being talked to about it. So just keep that in mind that, you know, farmers are doing their best. I think too, that it's, it's, uh, it's it, experimentation happens slow because of the, the cycle of the seasons. Farmers only plant uh, when they're growing grain crops like this, they only plant once a year. So it's not like they can have multiple different experiments and try different things. It, it takes time to do those experiments over the course of years. And so um, it, it's, you know, lots of exciting changes are happening, but it, by the nature of the business that, that farmers are in, it, it happens slowly. All right, another exciting uh, development that farmers continue to transition to more and more is cover crops. Again, this is highly dependent on the context on whether or not a cover crop is appropriate. So one way to think about it is that there's two types of crops you can grow, a cash crop 
uh, such as a crop that you're going to harvest and sell, and a cover crop that is literally just to cover the soil. So typically a cover crop would be grown in the seasons when you're not growing another crop and can have a number of different environmental benefits for that. And so you can see the soybean field here has some cover crop residue that's decomposing on the soil and they plant it directly into that. So there's a lot of different advantages to this. Um, one could be it, uh, it helps with weed control. It requires less herbicide application because it's blocking some of the light hitting that soil. Uh, again, cover crops have roots that are holding that soil in place throughout the winter. Um, some cover crops like in the upper left-hand corner, this is a, a called a tillage radish. Um, this is a, a really cool cover crop that actually mines the soil essentially. So the idea is a radish has a really long tap root that goes deep down in the soil, will pull up nutrients from deeper in the soil. And then when you leave that radish there to decompose, all those nutrients stay at the top layer of soil for the next crop that you plant to be able to take advantage of those nutrients. So lots of really cool things there. I believe this field down here is a mix of oats and radish. Um, oftentimes farmers will use different blends uh, of cover crops as well, again, for a variety of different reasons. So I've got a, a video, I've been doing a video series this summer called A Minute with a Guy Who Thinks Everyone Should Have a Garden. And so those of you who watched our, our presentations I've talked about before, I have a small specialty crop farm here in McLean County in central Illinois. And I've been experimenting with cover crops uh, the last couple of years. Actually, yesterday, I was planting um, some a buckwheat cover crop on a number of our beds on our farm. And so I continue to do experiments with it to see how I can fit cover crops into our small farm. So I did a video um, a while ago, uh, earlier in the season, um, comparing what we do on our small farm to a farmer that farms uh, around our house. And so we're gonna show you that video to give you a little bit more insight into some options with cover crops. Hey, it's Chris with Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom. You may have noticed as you drive around some fields this time of year that normally would still be bare soil are growing something and they're lush and green. Chances are these farmers are growing cover crops. And today I wanna to talk to you about cover crops on the farm, but also in the garden. This is a minute with a guy who thinks everyone should have a garden. There's basically two ways you can think about crops that a farmer would grow. There's a cash crop that they would harvest and then try to sell. And then there's a cover crop that is meant to cover the soil. So there's lots of reasons that farmers would use cover crops in their field. It could be to uh, prevent erosion. It could be to minimize weed pressure. It could be to add organic matter to the soil. Lots of different cover crops that farmers can grow. I'm actually standing in my neighbor's field right here and they planted this cover crop last fall. The field sat bare all winter and then early spring this cover crop started to grow and actually they came in yesterday and they planted soybeans into this living cover crop. They'll come back in a few days and they'll spray an herbicide over the cover crop that will kill the cover crop and allow the soybeans to come up through it and I'm assuming uh, will reduce weed pressure for them in the early stages of their soybean plant growth. So there's a lot of different ways that farmers are starting to incorporate cover crops more and more into their crop rotations, but they shouldn't have be having all the fun. There's lots of ways that gardeners can also incorporate cover crops into their rotation. I've actually started experimenting with that on my garden uh, and on my little farm as well. And so let me show you some of the ways that I'm starting to use cover crops. So here's a few beds that I planted with cover crop last fall. Let me show you what they looked like last fall going into winter. So when I planted these cover crops, this was my first time experimenting with them. And, and I wanted them to do a few things. I wanted them to add organic matter to the soil. I wanted them to protect the soil for beds that I wasn't growing on. So I, I wanted to keep roots actively growing in the soil to keep those microbes and bacteria and fungi and all those things actively going in the soil, even though I didn't have a cash crop to plant on them. So I chose a mix of oats and radishes. Uh, one of the other reasons that I chose this blend is I needed something that would winter kill. We typically don't use herbicides on our farm and so I didn't want to grow something as a cover crop that would continue to grow in the next spring and then turn into a weed for me. So I needed something that would naturally kill uh, in the, because of the cold in the winter and then I could mow it down and reincorporate incorporate it into the soil and then be ready to plant another cash crop again. Uh, you don't really need any specialized equipment. I literally planted this with a red solo cup and I just filled it up and I, I measured out how much I wanted to plant per bed and just spread it with that cup, lightly raked it in and watered it a few times and that was it. And then I just let it grow. Cover crops do have a spot in your garden potentially, depending on what you want to accomplish with them. You really don't need any specialized equipment to add some cover crops into your garden. Even if you're growing in raised beds, you could still try out some cover crops. 
So there's, there's a ton of different options. It's something worth experimenting with, but think about what you want to do. Do you want to add organic matter? Do you want to just protect your soil over the winter months? Uh, do you want to provide some kind of habitat for pollinators? I mean, there's all sorts of different things that you can do with cover crops that allow you to uh, have a better cash crop or a better garden crop the following year. The growing popularity of cover crops is a really exciting trend in agriculture, but keep in mind, not all cover crops are created equally, and there's always different contexts for different types of farming, so they don't work in all those different contexts. However, if you're interested in cover crops and want to try to add them to your garden, now's the time to do a little research and plan on how you can add them this year. Thanks for watching. All right, so again, cover crops is not a, a, not a new concept. They've been around for a long time, but it's something that again, with research over the years, farmers are finding more and more reason to, to experiment with cover crops and to try those out in their fields. And so I think that's something that we'll continue to see more and more of. Um, there's also some experiments going on, particularly at, at the uh, university level. Um, right here in Bloomington at Illinois State University, they're conducting trials on a, a statewide test of some new cover crops that could also be used as a cash crop. So you get the benefit of the cover crop, but you can also harvest something off of it and then be able to then turn around and plant corn or soybeans as well. And so lots of really, really exciting stuff going on with cover crops right now. Other thing I wanna talk about is carbon sequestration. This is something that's more and more in the news and something we hear a lot as, as we talk more and more about climate change, change um, carbon sequestration continues to be part of that conversation. So as far as in the context of agriculture, carbon sequestration is essentially the capacity of our agricultural lands to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and essentially bank that carbon in the soil. And so we have a lot of potential to be able to do that. Again, context is, is really, really important. So it depends on the climate, the soil type, um, the things that are being grown there, all sorts of different management practices. So there's a lots of different factors that go into it, but it's currently something that's, that's certainly being discussed at um, all levels, both in the ag industry, but also just in, in all industries is this idea of how can we continue to sequester more carbon to, uh, to prevent further climate change. And so currently right now, the, the last estimate I could find, the most recent one was that currently we're sequestering about 12% of US CO2 emissions with what we're doing already. And so there's lots of potential to potentially expand that. The question is, is how do we do that? There's talks of all sorts of different incentive programs for, for farmers and growers. There's talks of um, different industries paying to, uh, to, to uh, like, a, like a voucher, essentially. If they're producing CO2, they can pay a voucher and then incentivize uh, growers to be able to try to bank that carbon. So uh, it's, it's very much part of the uh, political dialogue right now. Nothing's been decided, but there's, there's lots of different ideas and talk about it. So again, it's something we wanted to point out because I think it's something that's going to continue to be part of that conversation in a way, again, that farmers could continue to contribute to, uh, to long-term environmental benefits um, with what they're already doing. And maybe by, by shifting some of their practices, they can have an even bigger role in that part of the, the equation. So, so lots there was carbon sequestration. Um, it's, a, it's a much more complicated topic than that, but that gives you a little bit of an introduction into that, essentially. And All another right, thing is that, yeah. I'm sorry, you can definitely, when you're looking at um, our junior high and senior high level teachers, any of you guys out there, this is an awesome opportunity for students to um, either start learning or um, really develop their understanding of these cycles, like the carbon cycle. And in the last screen, looking at, you know, the, um, the nitrogen cycle and everything in between, you know, where are these, uh, are these particles moving and flowing in and out of? And so there's a lot of uh, different things that you could even talk about in your classroom, even if your students maybe don't understand carbon sequestration, if you're in looking at sixth or seventh grade, um, that's the time where they're starting to learn about the carbon cycle. Um, and then looking at, well, what are some possible solutions? If we're thinking, gosh, you know, we, there is a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, maybe what are some um, ideas that they could come up with? So there's a lot of things that you could do um, to play off this idea of carbon sequestration, getting them to look into what is the conversation in politics or in just in general with farmers. Um, so there's a lot of things that can come from just this topic without having to dive deep into it at those lower grades, um, that, but you can also introduce these, these concepts and then play off of that. All right, and the last uh, exciting uh, development here we'll talk about is bioreactors. So this is a, a relatively new concept 
Um, farmers have been building bioreactors for maybe the last 10 or 15 years. And so it's still very much in an experimental phase. Again, it goes back to this idea that um, these things take time to develop. And so um, bioreactors, the idea is to prevent nitrogen runoff. So we hear a lot about nutrient runoff uh, and uh, nutrients leaving the field, um, moving into our waterways, um, you know, traveling down to the Gulf of Mexico, all those different things. And so um, farmers obviously have uh, a role to, to play in preventing this. All of us do, right? If we're uh, fertilizing our lawns and aren't really paying attention to how much nitrogen we're adding, well, that nitrogen is going to move somewhere. Nitrogen is water soluble. So um, anybody that's, that's, uh, that's fertilizing in any way has, has, uh, has a responsibility to make sure they're doing things to the best of their ability to keep that where it belongs. So the idea with a bioreactor is it basically you dig a hole and you can see with our graphics here. So um, most of our, our fields are tiled in Illinois. Our, our, our land would be relatively unfarmable if we didn't have some kind of drainage um, to be able to drain some of that water off to give us access into that, those soils. And so the field tile um, would, would export out into uh, this bioreactor, this hole that's been filled with wood chips. And essentially the idea is that uh, there's bacteria that's living, the, the wood chips are a carbon source for this bacteria, and they're going to feed off of that nitrogen and remove nitrates from that water. So then when the water goes out the other side of the bioreactor, uh, it's removed the nitrogen from it. Um, really cool, really, really interesting idea. Um, could potentially be a, a very exciting way to prevent that nutrient runoff and keep that nitrogen right there. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of questions with bioreactors. They're actually starting to dig up some of the bioreactors that they installed 10 or 15 years ago and try to better figure out, are the wood chips still there? Is it still working? Is it still doing what we think it's doing? And so uh, a really exciting thing going on and, and one of many examples of farmers uh, and, and leaders in the industry and researchers at the university level, but all playing their part, trying to find ways to, uh, to be better stewards of the land. So um, really interesting. Uh, we have a lesson that, that would pair well with this. Essentially, you can mimic a bioreactor if you just take a disposable aluminum baking pan and uh, put water in it with glitter. And you can see, you know, the glitter moves and then would leave that pan and you can see that you know, the glitter would represent that nitrogen. If you fill the pan with wood chips, do the same thing. The wood chips will grab that glitter and prevent much of that nitrogen or that glitter from running off of there. So that's a really uh, easy way to kind of mimic this for students and show them um, how this, this concept works. So again, um, lots more research needed with that, but uh, bioreactors are, are one of many ways that, uh, that, that farmers are trying to innovate and trying to find new ways to, uh, to, uh, to better take care of their lands uh, for future generations. You know, again, this is uh, installing a bioreactor in your farm. Is there, it's not like they're going to make more money, right? It costs a lot of money to build, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make them more uh, economically sustainable, right? And so there's a lot of different calculations and decisions that farmers need to make on how they approach these different things. And so, again, this is where there's, you know, all sorts of opportunities for partnerships um, between both public and private groups to, uh, to all have a, have a role in this and all uh, help so that we can uh, better take care of our earth, essentially. So this is just one of many examples of that. All right, Stephanie, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. All right. So we are nearing the end of our presentation. So the ag mags that we paired with this presentation, of course, are all focused on our row crops. So we have our corn ag mag, which is brand new this year. Um, we have our soybean ag mag and our wheat ag mag. And of course, we have our one page ag ventures that go right along with that. Um, if you are new and joining us this week, our ag mags, they are written around the fourth grade level, but can be used at, you know, many different age groups, Junior high and high school. Um, they are very colorful, they are cross-curricular, and they have lots of diagrams, vocabulary. Um, a lot of them have timelines. So again, cross-curricular, and then the ag ventures that go with them are also cross-curricular. Um, and if you notice, there are, uh, like on these three specifically, we have a couple of crossword puzzles and word searches, um, but these are a little bit more difficult because the, um, the clues they have to find, so especially with the, um, the word search, the, the clues are actually a question. They have to find the answer to that question and the answer 
is the word that's going to be hidden. So there's a little bit more uh, work to it. It's not just all, you know, all fun and games, but we wanted to do something fun, but also help them with their critical thinking skills, um, working with skills of, you know, all the skills that come with nonfiction text. Um, these, you can get them from your ag literacy coordinator, um, which can be found on our website and they are free. You can get packs of 25 of any of our topics, um, but you could also find them on our website. They are all interactive. And if you look right over here on the wheat, there's a little green leaf just above the, um, the United States map. And so on the interactive version, your students can click on that and it's gonna take them to another source that's gonna go a little bit more into depth about the information in that um, section. And so again, it's highlighting nonfiction skills, but also learning about um, um, you know, primary and secondary sources. So we are super excited about all of those. Um, our upcoming summer book club, you still have time to sign up if you're interested. So our summer book club, um, we're super excited about this. Chris is going to be running it. And basically, we're going to have on July 14th, so coming up real quick, um, we're going to have an introductory uh, little webinar via Zoom. So when you sign up, you'll get the link for that. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, the books, kind of give us a summary. We're going to talk about what you can expect with the book clubs. And then um, at the end of the webinar, you get to choose which one of these books you want to do the book club for. So if you choose The Thing About Luck, we will mail you a copy of The Thing About Luck. And if you choose Flip the Bird, we will mail you a copy about Flip the Bird. And then we'll give you a couple weeks to read them. And then on August 4th and August 5th, is when you will participate in the actual book club. So it's just gonna be one session starting at 6.30 p.m. And you're just gonna talk about um, different um, ideas and concepts. There's gonna be lessons that you can pair um, with these two novels. Um, so they are gonna be junior high, senior high level novels, um, but we're super excited to be hosting this. Um, and these are you know, some great books that are ag themed, um, easily tie in agriculture into your classroom. So go ahead. Um, the link is down here, um, iaitc.co backslash book club, um, or you can find that on the blog page once this ends. It's on our blog page. Um, and then also we do have our, uh, our uh, two classroom glance grants. Um, we have our project, our classroom project grant and our book grant. Um, so I will be hosting the Get a Grant workshop on August 5th at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm just gonna give you information about um, what the grants are about, uh, what's involved with them. We're gonna uh, look at different um, previous winners and you know what they uh, paired their grant with, what their projects were about and how they tied it into ag. And so we're just gonna kind of go um, into depth about what we're looking for. And um, I also have a series of um, activities that can be paired with um, the different categories of our book grant. So if you go to iaitc.co backslash get a grant, you can sign up there. Or again, um, at the end of this webinar, once we close out, you'll be redirected to that page and it'll be on there as well. So we hope to see you there. We're gonna keep shouting this out as long um, as it's before you know our deadline. So we hope to see you there. So um, as always, if you are have been with us, you know the deal. Um, if you are brand new um, and this is your first week with us, we do have a reflection for you to, to fill out. Now, this is week one of Row Crops. So week two of all of our series, we, um, we are doing hands-on activities. So if you are one of the first 50 people to fill out the reflection for today, um, we will send you a box of goodies so that you can follow along um, and participate with us. And that excludes coordinators. And unfortunately, it's only for Illinois teachers, but we do have um, the information. So join us, be there with us. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, and then, so I did not, yes, right here. So the very first link is July 6th. That's session one. That's what you're going to want to click on to do the reflection. The second link is for next week. So ignore that one. And then if you want to sign up for our block four, which we hope you do, because we're looking at specialty crops, um, which will begin on July 20th, that's gonna be the third link at the bottom. Um, if for some reason you've been having issues with when we close out of this, you're not getting redirected to the blog page, um, you can just 
just type in iaitc.co backslash July 6, and that'll take you to the page. Um, or you can go to our blog, which is www.beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com and click on this teacher training and then go to the heading that says Row Crops Virtual Teacher Training July 6 and 13. So there's multiple ways that you can get there just in case you know something goes awry and, and it doesn't um, automatically take you there. So the first 50 people will get a box from us. Um, and please don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we are posting all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, different articles, different, uh, you know, prizes, different, um, you know, lessons, all of that kind of stuff, our videos. So we hope that you follow us so that you can, uh, so you don't miss out on any of the fun stuff that we're doing. Um, but otherwise, I think that's all we have. So um, go ahead and enjoy the rest of your, of your Tuesday. Hopefully it's not too humid where you guys are. It's a little humid here. Um, but Chris, do we have anything else to share? I think that's it. Thanks again, everyone. We appreciate you being with us this morning. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And we hope to see you next week. Have a great rest of your day.